James Hill to the podium to speak about surgical and non-surgical approaches to offloading the diabetic foot. So we talked earlier, um, Dr. Latham and Dr. Rogers about stealing thunder of presentations and everything. Pretty much everything that I'm going to talk about has been talked about before. So, but um, we're going to do a brief review of the non-surgical and surgical offloading of the diabetic foot. And we'll go through the, uh, the guidelines just to meet the objectives of the presentation. And the guidelines are based on uh, um, strength of the recommendation and they're also uh, graded on the quality of the evidence behind the recommendation. Thanks. Um, for those of you that don't know, I'm James Hill. I'm the president of the Canadian Podiatric Medical Association as well as the Ontario Podiatric Medical Association. And it's, uh, it's been an honor to represent both of those groups. And, but honestly, it's one of those uh, one of those things where they ask you if anybody would like to step forward and everybody steps back and I'm the dummy still standing there. So um, thanks everybody. But um, I'm glad to be here and, and representing. We're glad to partner with uh, Wounds Canada for this conference. Um, so I have no disclosures. Nobody's paying me. Conflict of interest, uh, nothing. Uh, the objectives, we're gonna get through the, the uh, Basically, we're going to review the, the recently published uh, guidelines on offloading uh, published by the International Working Group on the Diabetic Foot that just came out this week, so it's lucky that I have this material available. So this is just a quick quiz. I'm not sure if that function is available or not. It's just a matter of uh, what we're planning on learning. Those, the, the guidelines are going to entail um, removable and non-removable offloading mechanisms, uh, as well as uh, Infection and ischemia. What was the answer? Not removable. Okay. So we have moderate infection, no ischemia. Um, we'll go on to the next slide. So the answers are coming in um, the future slides here, just as a matter of keeping some sort of interest while we're all sleepy after our great lunch. Um, so let's just define what we're talking about here. The non removable offloading devices include total contact cast and uh, basically in, we'll make a removable boot removable or non removable by applying um, some tape or some uh, cast material around the, uh, around the upper leg there. There's different types of total contact casting available. We've got a, a non-removable, removable boot here, the cam boot. Um, sometimes I'll just kind of put the seal on the door with some coband, even if you don't have the casting material available, it's a little bit. The disadvantage to these things um, is uh, the advantage to them is that you can't take them off, and like Dr. Rogers said, the disadvantage is that you can take them off, so they're, they're not without risk. Um, they use the term felted foam uh, in the working group uh, documents to accommodate padding, and then we've also got our standard therapeutic footwear. So there's essentially nine recommendations. Um, there's two of them involve recommendations regarding a heel ulcer and a non planter ulcer. So the, the recommendations that we're going to talk about are diabetic, neuropathic, uh, ulcer of the forefoot or the, or the knee foot. So this is one of those diagrams again that Dr. Rogers was talking about that it's very difficult to follow. There's errors and arrows and colors and all these kind of things. We're going to go through each step by step here. So the working group recommendation number one is essentially uh, strong evidence and the quality of evidence is high for using a non removable total contact cast or a non-removable, removable cam um, The next step is if they can't tolerate that or the resources aren't available, we get them a removable boot. We're going to fly through a lot of this with a material that's fairly obvious to those of us in the room. But the one thing that I think has been um, hinted at across our conversations today is that we, we take for granted what uh, physicians in the community really know about the diabetic foot. So things that seem fairly obvious to us about wounds and neuropathy are often misdiagnosed and miscategorized and they're, they're placed in an offloading device that may not be totally appropriate. So um, the subtlety of some of these recommendations is, is important. If they can't tolerate a knee-high boot, then you recommend the ankle-high boot. The key to the recommendations two and three is the encouragement. I guess you have to wag your finger at them and tell them you've got to wear the boot that we told you to wear. Um, we're now talking about uh, different degrees of infection. So there's recommendations regarding um, heel ulcers 
and forefoot ulcers with uh, moderate ischemia, moderate infection, mild ischemia, mild infection. Um, basically, if there's an infection or concern about ischemia, we want to have the access to them. Surgical recommendations uh, included uh, our Achilles tendon lengthening that's been discussed before. We talked about metatarsal head resection, arthroplasty of joints, bony resections to get that one to heal. Another surgical recommendation is uh, uh, flexor tenotomy of the digits. We all do it in the room here, I'm sure. Um, this is the recommendations regarding mild or moderate uh, degrees of infection. We have a, I think you're, uh, Dr. Uh, you're talking about the heel ulcer and off the heel ulcer, so there's going to be some interesting things to follow in, in our discussion here. So I'm going to um, continue to talk about surgical offloading of the diabetic foot. And uh, there's different degrees of um, intervention, and some say that elective surgery is, is contraindicated. And that's the point of my polling question. We don't ask, we don't really have to ask the questions. The matter is, is there's, there's different ways that we address the foot surgically, and there's different reasons why we do it. Um, the study has been, our, our classification system was developed in the past that talks about the four different reasons why we're doing uh, foot surgery on the diabetic foot. We've already discussed ankle equinus, and the evaluation of that equinus can't be overlooked. Um, people in the community may be able to diagnose equinus, but sometimes it's overlooked if there's a bony block and you're diagnosing a soft tissue equinus and you're going to try and eliminate that equinus with a soft tissue release, you're going to get in trouble in a hurry. So we have to really make sure we know what we're doing. There's different degrees and different levels of surgical release. Um, we've talked about the, the percutaneous flexor tenotomy. This should be in the, in the uh, realm of possibility to uh, really pretty much every practitioner here in, in Ontario, probably or podiatrist. Dr. Uh, Rogers has talked about the sharp old foot. We also talk about uh, offloading that foot with an amputation. Sometimes it's necessary. We can get a good functional result that will last for years and years if it's properly offloaded. Um, the most aggressive form of cure for any of this problem is a major amputation with either an above knee or an above knee amputation. So I'd like to talk and really kind of hijack the presentation here about what's going on in, in our country with podiatry and, uh, and wound care of the diabetic foot. Um, I've got a polling question here, and I don't, there's really no wrong answer to this, and, and we don't really have to complete it. The point of the, 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 um, the question really is, is who are we referring to? And in Ontario, really, who knows? There's a bunch of, there's a lot of um, confusion about what is a podiatrist, what is a podiatric surgeon, <laughs> What is a chiropodist? And I've talked to colleagues in other jurisdictions, podiatrists in my own country here, that really don't know what it is happening here in Ontario. And um, I think it's it's really a shame that we're, we're coming to this um, to this meeting. We're still asking these questions. It's been 20 years since there was a hard cap placed on podiatrists. There hasn't been a new registrar podiatrist class since 1993. I came in shortly after I joined, uh, and joined my wife in practice, and she's registered as a podiatrist, and my registration as a chiropodist. Um, I practice part-time in Ontario as a chiropodist, and then I practice part-time in Detroit as a podiatric physician and surgeon, doing a lot of those surgical cases and prescribing a lot of these offloading devices and really managing the um, nuts and bolts of the diabetic foot from prevention to surgical and non-surgical treatment, medical management, uh, coordinating our care really with infectious disease, uh, vascular surgeons, endocrinologists, nursing, all the people in this room. And we have absolutely uh, limited, if any, access to those types of uh, coordinated care models here in Ontario. Um, there's been a, essentially been a cap placed on our competency level as well. Like we're, we're, we have a competency, but there's a, there's a ceiling as to our scope of practice. It's, there's some anatomical barriers, there's, uh, there's regulatory barriers as far as uh, uh, information that we're allowed to obtain from our patients as far as even clinically. So you can see here our, our colleagues out west in Alberta and BC are practicing what we're defining here as podiatry um, in this room today. Uh, 
Um, there are several instances when the questions were asked about who's doing what and what interventions are you making. And I'm kind of I'm deciding whether to raise my hand or I can't raise my hand because the limit to a lot of these things um, is, uh, is, is really, uh, it's disgraceful that we don't have access to it. Um, there's been talk in the government about funding for increasing podiatry services. What we're talking about the costs that are put upon the patient and the health system with amputations and hospitalizations. Our uh, colleague from uh, Hamilton is, is doing some great work on an outpatient basis, and, and you think you nailed it right on the head about a lot, most of these things don't need to be done in the hospital, and I think that's where podiatry in Ontario can really um, prove their worth. Taking the lessons learned out west, bringing them back home. Um, I think the reason that I'm continuing to talk about this over and over and mentioning it is we really need your help in this room. We need help convincing the Canadian government and the Ontario government that they need to remove this cap on, on podiatrist regist registrants in, in Ontario. And there's some uh, promising discussions that we've had with government recently, but we still haven't crossed that finish line. Um, we keep talking about funding and it's expensive. I dare to say that if you get the <coughs> testing mechanisms in the right hands, we're going to see less resources used. We're not going to have ultrasounds and diagnostic testing or for no reason. We're going to get it into people that are um, qualified and competent to participate fully in the continuum of care. Um, the encouraging thing, we had a discussion last night, Dr. Casey uh, organized a symposium on starting to talk about research and podiatry um, is really grossly underrepresented in Canada. We keep talking about American data. Um, we need to start doing things here at home. We must demand that new perspective on diabetic limb preservation. That's what I interest here in Ontario. That's my closing message. Thanks again for the opportunity.